Uh, on the back, under passings, uh, you'll see, uh, uh, f- pray for the family of Steve Agee. Uh, it's my stepdad. He passed away on Saturday evening. Uh, we do not have any daughter make sure she lives out of state and and uh, it'll either be the end of this month or the or into next month probably before there's a memorial service um there and then the family of uh, robert wingate uh this is uh, joyce may's cousin's husband he passed away on friday and so remember those in your prayers let's go to the lord in prayer over these and uh, also our time of bible study Heavenly Father, we come to you and we we do bring these requests to you. Lord, you know uh, each uh, situation here, you're intimately aware of them. And Father, we pray that you would just uh, move in each way, in the unique way that you can uh, for each one represented here. Those that we mentioned and even those that we did not that have been on here for some time, Lord, that need your touch. And we just pray, Lord, that you would do your will in each situation. Now, Father, we pray for the Bible study tonight and our time together. May you uh, challenge us, and Lord, may you encourage us. And Father, may may you enlighten us as well uh, with your word. And Father, we pray that if there's an area that needs correcting, we might be convicted tonight uh, from it. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. We'll take God's word and turn to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. And I've entitled tonight, More Powerful Than the Word of God. More Powerful Than the Word of God. We're going to look at chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. Before you throw me out as a heretic, just bear with me. And uh, uh, maybe we can connect the dots together uh, with this. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. And would you stand with me, please, in honor of the reading of God's word. The Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him when they had come from Jerusalem and had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. The Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? And he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that would help you is korban, that is to say, given to God. You no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother. Thus, invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. Thank you. You can be seated. It is a sad today that our culture now favors wimps and weaklings and punishes people of strong conviction. We now have this new term, toxic masculinity. That's foreign to me. I was raised to be a man. When I was a boy, I wanted to be a man. As a father, I want my boys to be men. It doesn't mean that they have to run roughshod over women and ladies or their spouses down the road, Uh, but there's something to be said about being a man. In this, God created them both male and female. Uh, But we have this 
new term, toxic masculinity, in our vocabulary. We punish men and we punish boys for being masculine. And we parade and, we parade and promote those who are not. So let's just leave it at that. If you hold certain beliefs or you defend a particular set of principles these days, then you are, or we are considered ignorant or arrogant and bigoted. If we hold strongly to our opinions, we're intolerant, unbending, and narrow. If we confront someone who is in error, we are rude and unloving. If we believe there are times it is right to fight or to resist, we are labeled as contentious and hateful. Do you see how the, the deck is stacked against us in this regard? Now, e even though we have the assurance that the truth sets us free, we sometimes find ourselves a little uncomfortable when someone has the guts to state the truth without apology, especially if they do it publicly. Uh, to those who need to hear it, they will take that stand and if, even point a finger in them, and yet we sometimes find ourselves a little uncomfortable and embarrassed by it. But if someone doesn't stand up to challenge those who are in authority, who have departed from the truth, every playground will be run by bullies. Every nation will be controlled by tyrants. Every church will be intimidated by legalists. The truth must be spoken or error will run wild and we will all suffer for it. Every generation needs someone who publicly challenges the directors of all of the groupthink that's out there and dares to speak the truth to them. This is one of the reasons why I am a huge admirer of Winston Churchill. <laughs> I love Sir Winston Churchill. If you come to my library, I have numerous books of his and books of his speeches and so forth. I like him because when the whole world, world leaders all over the globe were saying that they could work with that madman, Adolf Hitler, Churchill would have none of it. And he exposed him to a world that initially was not ready to agree with him. But history has shown us eventually they came to discover what Churchill had known for so long and united behind him. Jesus was never one to run from conflict. The rich and the powerful did not intimidate him. Confronting the imposing religious elite of Israel simply didn't fit into his program yet. Having completed several trips uh, around Galilee and after sending his disciples out to preach the good news the time had come to turn his attention southward toward Jerusalem which was the stronghold of theological and religious error in that first century world Jesus didn't take his ministry there at this point the journey would come later but he was heading in that direction instead he began to confront the various factions from, sent out from Jerusalem as part of his agenda, becoming increasingly assertive in his approach. Now, up to this point here in, in Mark's gospel, Jesus had countered the religious authorities with clear reasoning of Scripture. But the time for that has apparently come to an end. When a group of religious leaders from Jerusalem uh, came to Capernaum to pick a fight with Jesus, the gloves came off. The men who had perverted the Lord's covenant with Abraham and turned Judaism into a legalistic cult needed to feel the wrath of God for leading so many astray. 
And so that's where we find ourselves in. Jesus is not a wimp. He is not a weakling. He is one who is taking a stand for what is right. He is not going to let error persist. He is going to stand up to religious tyrants and deal with their legalism in which they wanted to keep so many bound by it. Well, there's only two things tonight. Last week I had five points, I believe it was, uh, or three points the week before I had five. Tonight there's just two. Uh, we're getting shorter. We're whittling them down. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the sermon will be any shorter. It just means there's fewer points. I'll just spend more time making the point than I will going to points. The first thing I want you to notice is the religious leaders' accusations. The religious leaders' accusations. Look at verses 1 and 2. This kind of helps set the table. The Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him when they had come from Jerusalem and had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. This group of religious leaders from Jerusalem included Pharisees uh, here. And, and by Jesus' time, the Pharisees, which once uh, admired loyalty to nationalism and devotion to the law, ha it had taken on a, a life of its own. These meticulous uh, expositors of Scripture worked tirelessly to preserve an oral tradition uh, about to apply uh, uh, the law of Moses to everyday life. The Pharisaic rabbis added a, a long list of specific duties and prohibitions to the law. They added upon top of what was already there given by God. And no one rivaled the Pharisees in being religious. They were, the elite, they were the elite of the religious. The scribes, were told here, were also with them, and they were men of letters. Those who were highly skilled at reading and writing, especially when it came to scouring the Hebrew Scriptures. They were likely the ones primarily responsible for meticulously copying the Old Testament to preserve it from decay and corruption. In any case, their, their constant contact with God's Word made them extremely knowledgeable. These men were called upon to explain and apply the law. James would say of them they were merely hearers of the, law, of, of the Word of God. They were not doers. Mark's telling of the story strongly suggests that the Pharisees and scribes had arrived with one mission, and that was to trap Jesus. The last time we saw the Pharisees was in a Galilean synagogue where, where Jesus defied their rules and, and against healing on the Sabbath. And, and afterward, um, we, we read that they went out, that is, the Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. Do y'all remember that from Mark chapter 3? Obviously, they wanted to discredit him publicly before disposing of him physically. So they started with the relatively minor issue, ceremonial hand washing. Now, we don't really think nothing of that, especially when we come to worship and Hopefully we all wash our hands before we eat, but we don't think that that makes you, you know, a sin against God, do we? Maybe a sin against your fellow man, but not a sin against God. And so they deal with this hand washing. Look at verses 3 through 5. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? Now, for the benefit of his Gentile readers, that's you and I, Mark explains the peculiar, this peculiar issue involved in this ritual. 
Uh, it talked about when they would go to the market, they would cleanse themselves because they would do that because they didn't know when they might have brushed up against a, a, a carcass of an animal or up against a Gentile and therefore they were defiled. And uh, can you imagine living in such prejudice um, and having that in your own heart and mind? But so they would always cleanse themselves whenever they were out in public. And so he gives us a little bit of this, but it it's really doesn't help us in the 21st century, does it? That's, it's foreign to us to understand that. But there is a Jewish scholar, Alfred Edersheim, and he has summarized this tradition, and so I'm just going to read to you what he says. Just hold on with me. As the purifications were so frequent, and care had to be taken that the water had not been used for other purposes, or something falling into it might discolor or defile it, large vessels or jars were generally kept for the purpose. These might be of any material, although stone is specifically mentioned. It was the practice to draw water out of these with what was called a natal, antila, or antelaya, very often of glass, which must hold at least a quarter of a log. What is a quarter of a log, you're asking? I'm glad you asked, because I've got the answer here, according to Alfred Edersheim. A quarter of a log is a measure equal to one and a half eggshells. They didn't miss anything with legalism, did they? So they had to wash with a, a glass vessel, which would hold a, a quarter of a log, for no less quantity than this might be used for a fusion. The water was poured on both hands, which must be free of anything covering them, such as gravel, mortar, etc. The hands were lifted up so as to make the water run to the wrist in order to ensure that the whole hand was washed and that the water polluted by the hand did not again run down the fingers. Similarly, each hand was rubbed with the other, provided the hand that rubbed had been effused. Otherwise, the rubbing might be done against the head or even against a wall. Now, how clean would that wall have been? You see how legalism just is, is ridiculous? But there was one point on which special stress was laid. In the first effusion, which was all that originally was required when the hands were not Levitically defiled, the water had to run down to the wrist. If the water remained short of the wrist, the hands were not clean. Accordingly, the words of Mark can only mean that the Pharisees eat not, except they wash their hands to the wrist. Now, the excessively detailed, tedi I mean, aren't you glad we just use soap and water? <laughs> I mean, this is a tedious process here. It became highly symbolic for the Pharisees who saw this. They saw this as an expression of love for God's law. Aren't we wonderful? We go through this so often. I mean, our hands look like, you know, they're just wrinkled all the time because we wash so much. We just love God's law. Notice it was a love for God's law, not a love for God. Pharisees gladly endured this and other similar rituals every day in every sphere of life, all for the sake of trying to, to look like they were pleasing God. And what they expected of themselves, they certainly expected of anyone who dared to call himself a son of the covenant. So we see the religious leaders' accusations. But now notice the Lord's response. Look at verses 6 through 8. And he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men, neglecting the commandment of God you hold to the tradition of men. The Pharisees challenged Jesus on something relatively minor, but still serious enough to discredit him in their culture. For them, this, this was just the first, first jab. This was the first blow, if you will. Uh, this was just 
to begin merely the, the opening round of a calculated strategy ending with a, which would be a murder Jesus. But as any military strategist understands, you cannot let the enemy dictate the fight. Uh, the Pharisees had, had proposed to dispose of an insignificant, untrained, upstart rabbi from the discredited town of Nazareth. They did not expect to match wits with the author of truth in human flesh. Notice there in, in verse 6 that in his rebuke, Jesus called these religious leaders hypocrites. It was a word used often of actors or pretenders, specifically pretenders in this case. Secular Greek writers used the term both positively and negatively, depending upon what the situation was in the context. In a positive sense, it was used to describe one who dutifully portrayed a character on the stage. But it could also be used negatively if one viewed the stage as a sham world and actors as deceivers. Then notice that Jesus did what he often did. He appealed to the scriptures to identify the Pharisees as the contemporary version of the critics of Isaiah's day that he wrote about. Jesus does not want any confusion as to why he calls them hypocrites. This is not a positive use of the word hypocrite. Isaiah mourned the loss of, of true devotion to God. They set aside his inerrant word in favor of man-made religiosity. In fact, they had strayed as, as far from the truth that when truth incarnate stood before them, they condemned him as a heretic. Notice verses 9 through 13. He was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that would help you is korban, that is to say, given to God. You no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother. Thus, invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. To make his point plain, Jesus compared one of their traditions to the fifth commandment. Now, Exodus 20, verse 12, gives us the fifth commandment. In case you've forgotten it, honor your father and your mother that your days may be promised in the land which the Lord your God gives you. The motivation to obey this commandment should have resonated with the Pharisees who, who longed to rid Israel of Roman interlopers and return to the glory days of David's reign. They should have relished that. Then also there in, in verse 10 here of, of Mark chapter 7, Jesus referenced Exodus 21 verse 17 in which God forbids the disrespecting of parents upon a penalty of death. Exodus 21, 17 says, He who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. So Jesus is using Scripture. He's used Isaiah, now he's used Exodus, the, the writings of Moses, the lawgiver. Let's not forget that the Pharisees' ultimate goal is to do what? destroy Jesus but in this way in referencing Exodus 21 17 Jesus has turned the tables around to show that they not he deserve death and then the Lord Jesus cited a well-known tradition among the Pharisees to which they assigned the technical term korban which is a Greek transliteration of a Hebrew word that describes something that is set aside and reserved for God's exclusive and special use. This could include people or money or land, possessions, inheritance. It, it could be anything. You could just say, oh, that's Korban. 
for God's use. You see, the Pharisees used Numbers chapter 30, verses 2 through 4 as a pretext. This is what Numbers 30, verse 2 and 3 and 4 says. If a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to bind himself with a binding obligation, he shall not violate his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Also, if a woman makes a vow to the Lord and binds herself by an obligation in her father's house in her youth, and her father hears her vow, and her obligation by which she has bound herself and her father says nothing to her, then all her vows shall stand, and every obligation by which she has bound herself shall stand. Now, we probably didn't realize that's what this was, but we're familiar with this taking place over in the book of 1 Samuel. Hannah is praying for a child. And she prays, and in her praying, she says what? Lord, if you'll give me this child, I will korban. I will give him to you. He will be yours. It's the same principle. It's the same idea. And so the Pharisees claimed that a vow of obligation takes precedence over other normal obligations, including the Ten Commandments. You can see how, how this would work out as fallen creatures as, as we are always looking for loopholes. <laughs> Based on this tradition, a person could, could just dedicate all of his possessions to God, dedicate himself completely to God, and then just excuse himself from all other duties such as caring for mom and dad in their old age. Well, I'd like to help you, and yeah, I know I've got a lot of money, but I, that, I've given that to the Lord. Mom, I know you need a new roof, but I've dedicated myself to the Lord. I can't be up there putting shingles on your house. That's what was happening. And they were, they were completely ignoring and violating what, what God had said. They had created these traditions of men and had placed them in such a place that they were trumping over what God had actually said. And Jesus is just exposing them. The Pharisees had cleverly turned the law against itself, finding in one law a pretext for disobeying many other laws. Now look at verse 13 again. Thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition. In fact, underline or highlight that phrase because we'll touch on that in a moment. Thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition which you have handed down and you do many things such as that. Jesus is saying you do this often. You do this all the time. This is not one instance. We're not just talking about families here how we treat our moms and dads. This, you do this all the time, how you just completely turn the law against itself and put all of these things so to give people loopholes. You constantly take the law and twist it. And in so doing, their traditions invalidated the Word of God. And their thinking, the Pharisees had had turned their traditions into being more powerful than the Word of God. This is what legalism always does. It makes the rules of more importance than Scripture. Often, the rules are more akin to someone's own preferences than they are the Bible. The last word from Jesus shut down the scribes' attack, but it also reputed their entire manner of living and condemned their supposed piety as heresy. Now, let me just wrap all of this up. Let's, uh, let's give the Pharisees a, a little break. Let's not be too tough on them. Because frankly, and I'm standing here, a part of this is, is I'm speaking to you. Frankly, we need to check ourselves out as it relates to legalism. I find if I'm not careful that 
I can easily turn into a 21st century Pharisee and legalist. For instance, if, if we're not careful, we can shame other people's lives, especially from their past, rather than help to set them free. I have this difficulty where, where I want to control the lives of our boys rather than cultivate trust within them as a parent. The Lord has a sense of humor because my boys are not the same. They're opposites in so many ways. What worked with one doesn't work with the other. I can, I can look at Clayton, just look at him, and he melts. I can look at, Clay, at Garrett, and he takes a drag off a cigarette and flicks it in my face. No, he doesn't do that, but I mean, <laughs> he doesn't do that, but, but it takes a little bit more than a look to get his attention. I'm just making sure y'all are awake, folks, and paying attention. <laughs> it just takes, you can't do that. You can't raise them the same, can you? But I want to control them, but no, I need to cultivate trust within them. They need to understand that when mom and dad says something, it's, it's for their good because we love them and they ought to do it because we know what's best and not because they're afraid of consequences. I, I've known people who constantly look for sin in other people's lives and then they go after them for it. I, I, I know of, and, and often we're guilty of the fact that somebody doesn't look like us, dress like us, act like us and we are judgmental on that that's what legalism is legalism is all about appearances that's what legalism is it's as shallow as appearances you can go all the way back to the old testament and god was dealing with his people as they were living under the law when God told Samuel, don't look at his height or his appearance, for man looks at the outside of a man, but God looks at the heart. That's what Christianity is. That's what, what a relationship with God is, is the heart. Now, I'm a firm believer that once God gets a hold of our heart, that it begins to take effect also outside, outwardly. But let's not get so trapped and, and caught up in somebody's outward appearance. I've, listen, folks, I've been fooled too many times myself on that. Thinking, boy, that's a good church member right there. Boy, I tell you, let, let's, put, let's let them do this or let's get them to do that. And then the next thing I know, I'm devastated. But they look like us, talk like us. We also need to make sure that we aren't going to be blind to our own faults while using a magnifying glass to search out the faults of others. Let's us agree tonight. It's just us in here tonight. Let, let's just us agree tonight that we're going to try, we're going to stop trying to put others in our own little boxes. Rather, let's agree that we're going to encourage others to be free. Not live to our legalistic standards, but be free. Free to be all that God created and saved us to be. In our text this evening, Jesus didn't use the word free. We don't see that anywhere in here. He did not use the word free. But can you imagine being those disciples having these great respected religious leaders come out and accuse you and bring all sorts of accusations against you, you'd have probably felt that tall. But then Jesus spoke up and rebuked them and told them exactly, as my granddaddy would say, how the cow eats the cabbage. I'm going to tell you right now, Jesus doing that, he set the disciples free. He set them free right then and there. So let's, let's not 
put people in boxes to live up to our expectations. Let's set them free to be all that God created and saved every one of us to be. Free, free from the bondage of, of sin. Uh, free from guilt. Free from the snide remarks. And free to do what God desires us to do for His glory. Otherwise, otherwise, we become guilty of practicing something that invalidates the Word of God and goes against it. Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word. Lord, help us to seek to be those who want to extol grace, extend grace, and set, set people free from bondage. Lord, we don't want to put them in our box. Father, you have a much better way of crafting us in your image. We don't want them to be in our image, but in yours. So help us, Lord, to, to let go and let you do what you want to do. Now, Father, we pray you'd be with us throughout the remainder of this week. We do pray for rain. We, Lord, we pray you'd send it our way. We desperately need it. And, Lord, we pray that you would just give us a, a good, good amount of rain all over this region. I'll be with us Sunday, and as we prepare to gather here on Sunday, Lord, may you, may you speak to our hearts, and we pray, Lord, that decisions might be made during the invitation time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.